Hello. I'm going to be talking about question two in the September-December 21 exam, agency group. Question two is the question that would traditionally have an ethics component, as this does. Year ended is 31st of December 07. Um, you would find it useful to pause the tape and read the question um, step by step and just do your own little plan before you listen to what I have to say. The first thing that was asked about was the appropriateness of the accounting treatment on for foreign exchange gains on a subsidiary. It was only a couple of marks. So A1 was about FX gains on a subsidiary. Three marks. As always, when in doubt, start with your knowledge and then try and apply it. So you know that FX gains on translating subsidiaries, net assets and goodwill go to reserves, not, not to the profit and loss account. Another way of saying reserves is, of course, OCI. So the main rule is that gains and losses, again, on retranslation, go to OCI, or Foreign Exchange Reserve. You might know the other fact, and that is that on sale of the subsidiary, they are recycled to the P&L. Maybe you knew it, maybe you didn't, but you certainly knew the first sentence. So they're recycled to the profit and loss on sale of the subsidiary. Recycling means that a gain that was earlier shown in OCI is now later shown in PL. There are not many examples left. Another example, nothing to do with this, but is cash flow hedges. Anyway, there's my knowledge. Having got the knowledge, then apply or application. Well, they have put the gain in the profit and loss. That's wrong. Is the company sold? No, it's held for sale. Held for sale is not sold, is it? If you're selling something, you haven't sold it. So, therefore, the gain has been treated incorrectly. So, the message is that held for sale is not the same as sold. So, the client is wrong. The gain or loss, presumably it's a gain, should be in reserves. OCI means reserves, doesn't it? That's the actual double entry, not the profit and loss. Three marks, straightforward. Second part of the question, six marks plus two extra marks, is then looking at the ethical issues and actions around the way that this poor trainee accountant again has been treated don't forget you get the extra two marks if you apply um, ethical knowledge to the scenario that's the key thing that you really marry up for each sentence something that relates to ethics with something that relates to the scenario and if you can produce six sentences that do that, you're going to get the six basic marks and then two extra marks, again, just because you've married them together. Remember, we can all um, always play our um, joker, and that's you always going to get a mark for saying that accountants in practice are bound by the code of ethics. Um, Mr. Let's have a look. Miss 
Miss M, uh, Malgun. Well, she's an accountant. I assume she's ACCA. He is certainly an accountant. He's a student accountant, Mr. Ravi. So, Mr. Ravi and I'll put Miss M are both bound by the ACCA Code of Ethics. <clears throat> ACCA members or ACCA student members. And then look all the way through the scenario. It may not be as well structured as the answer. It doesn't matter. If you end up with six points and they feel a little bit random, I don't think it matters as long as you're linking knowledge again um, to a specific ethical threat or a specific ethical principle. So, for example, again, we can think about raising the threat of intimidation. Again, because poor Mr. Ravi, again, is suffering under fear of dismissal. So Mr. Ravi's fear of dismissal. His boss sounds a bit horrible, really. But don't write the word horrible in the exam. Um, he got the accounting treatment wrong. So that's the point, isn't it? That he has incorrectly applied the accounting treatment. That's professional competence and due care. So that is the use of the incorrect accounting treatment. That's more to do with Mr. Ravi. However, when you get to Mrs. M, it goes much deeper, doesn't it? Because she knew that the accounting treatment was wrong. So that is definitely the principle of integrity. Integrity, that's because Ms. M knew the accounting treatment was wrong. Um, what other threats are relevant? We've got these performance targets that the company's got and Mrs. M gets profit-related pay. So we can link that, can't we? You can link it to the principle that's objectivity or the threat that's self-interest. So self-interest threat because of Mrs. M's performance-related pay. Um, in addition, um, she has left him to get on with stuff, hasn't she? And so she should really have not let a student accountant deal with something so complex. So I guess she's been negligent. Perhaps Mr. Ravi is more about professional competence. Miss M is perhaps more about due care. So let me write that principle again. And the reason why I'm thinking about that is that she delegated irresponsibly. She said, you sort it out, even though it's really complicated. So again, so that is irresponsible delegation. And that is on the part of Miss, Miss M. She's Miss M, isn't she? So Miss M. I, you probably haven't, but if you look at sometimes the report of disciplinary committees, 
where accountants and student accountants find themselves in trouble and potentially being thrown out of ACCA or another accounting body. When you read the report, all you see in the report, again, of the disciplinary committees are the blue words. So if it's not one of these threats, if it's not one of these principles, you shouldn't be up before the committee in the first place. And literally, it's almost like ringing a bell every time you manage to actually name a principle, explain it and apply it to the scenario, a bell rings and the examiner is happy. Let's have one more ring. If you feel there's not enough there, you could then explain these principles or threats a bit more. For example, again, define integrity. We all know, don't we? That's all about being, for example, straightforward and honest. So lots of things that we could bring in there. There's part A2. Pause the recording if you need to before you watch the next part. The next part, part B, is worth five marks and it is accounting for the sale of a license to a company beginning with K. I'll just call it K. And that's worth five marks. Now, I thought this was hard. I was a bit confused about trying to understand exactly the scenario. So how on earth do we pick up the marks when we are a bit confused in that situation there? So we're looking down the scenario. So we, someone is going to actually give us some money now. So quite a lot of money, 15 million and possibly another three. In return, they've got exclusive sales rights in South America. So they can go all around South America and sell the product. That's probably quite separate, isn't it, from the actual sale of the product, which is at markup of 15%, of 50%. So maybe you were as far able to get as far as saying, okay, I can see a bit of revenue recognition in here. And perhaps you were able to say, well, revenue recognition perspective, there are actually two performance obligations. Remember, don't write out the whole model. That seems to annoy the examiner at the moment. First of all, the one we're being asked about, which is the sale of the license. And secondly, later on, there'll be a sale of the product. The sale of the product will be easy, won't it? Because when they want some aspirins or whatever they are, they'll buy some from us for 10, they'll sell it on for 15. We'll book a sale of 10 when we transfer the goods. But we're interested here in terms of the sale of the license. In respect of the sale of the license, remember in the revenue recognition model, step three is that we would need to determine the price. And then you've got the debate, haven't you? between 15 and the extra three, which is 18. The, the three is uncertain. At least it looks, there's nothing in the scenario. So the three million is uncertain. Therefore, presumably, in terms of the license, again, presumably, again, we would only be able to recognize the 15 million. Again, it's a tough question because you're then wondering about whether you need to talk about whether it would be over a point in time or a period in time, a period of time. 
The answer doesn't seem to go anywhere there. It's only a few marks anyway, isn't it? But one of the messages, we've got to separate out these obligations. The most likely price, step three of the revenue recognition model, is certainly the 15 million. I think that the, the point that many people wouldn't have spotted was at the end it said that there was an intangible asset with a carrying amount of 30 million. I know you were perhaps sitting there and saying, well, what's this? And I suppose that's the thing, part of which is being sold. You know, if it was a question about the sale of a bell, we'd have no trouble, would we? We'd say proceeds less carrying amount. If you had five bells and sold one of them, it wouldn't be a worry. So the answer also says, well, it's really like the sale of something that's in intangibles. So I don't think many candidates would have got this far, but maybe you did. And actually what they're saying is that in terms of that sale, the profit on the sale of the license If we said that the proceeds are 15, the carrying amount is perhaps the existing development costs. I say perhaps. We're selling 20% of them. 20% of 30 is 6. And this is, I think, not at all set in stone but you're just kind of hypothesizing about what an accounting treatment might be. So I don't think the last point people have got near, but in terms of analyzing the transaction, I think the point about most likely price everyone should get to, and hopefully you thought about this idea that the sale of the license is separate from the sale of the product. Quite a tough little question there, I think. It's a good job, isn't it, that the rest of this question was very straightforward. Now we come to the last part of the question, which was requirement two, which was the very final four marks. And this was about the accounting treatment of development costs of a new biosecurity drug or bio something drug, biosimilar drug, that's the word, isn't it? Not biosecurity. And you should have been saying, mama, I've come home. Apparently, when this came up in the exam, people were completely sausage and I don't know why, because the basics about research and development they don't belong in this exam. They don't belong in the exam below. They belong in the exam below that. Almost when you were five years old at school, putting your hand up saying, Miss, I want to be an accountant. We know those rules, don't we? It's about research versus development. So this is a place when you certainly say, OK, here comes some knowledge and then we'll see if we can apply it. The knowledge is, isn't it, IS38, research costs must go to the P&L, development costs, if you've heard of Archimedes, I think it was Archimedes who invented something, he was said to leap out of the bath when he invented something, I can't remember what, shouting, Eureka, Eureka, and again, it's at that moment that he invented something famous. That's when research switches to development. And the point is, isn't it, that you capitalise those if you meet certain criteria. Those criteria are, for example, that the product should be technically feasible, It should be commercially viable. 
it should be profitable. You need to have enough resources to finishing developing the product. So if there are adequate resources and so on. So having set out the knowledge, application is now straightforward. Because on the one hand, it does say that um, they've got initial regulatory approval. Sounds good. However, on the other hand, it does say, doesn't it, that they're really doing this so they've got a good reputation in the market. They won't pay, make any money on it particularly, so it's not expected to be profitable. It's really just about enhancing their brand value. So I would be saying, well, okay, although they do have initial regulatory approval has been given, the product is unlikely to be profitable. Therefore, unfortunately, again, these costs, so the development costs should probably be expensed. Just take a look back through that whole question for a moment and just think how we should have been scoring. Foreign exchange gains, everyone knows they go to OCI. Maybe you didn't know about recycling. You get two out of three. Ethics, if you can't get seven out of eight, unforgivable. As long as you apply your knowledge to the scenario, did so maybe six then. So that's eight marks so far. This one, hard, I think, but we can probably drag out a couple of marks, 10 marks so far. And again, easily, you should get four marks on the last part. Basic accounting knowledge. Remember, Open Tuition on their website have flashcards with all of that basic knowledge in, and they are free for you to use. There we are, question two in the exam.